So without further ado, what I'm going to do is uh, introduce the panel. Um, we've got uh, Alex Bloom with us. We've got Joe uh, Pupolo, Mark Evans, and Aaron Burry. And I'm actually going to go this way with Aaron first to just do a little bit of a quick introduction, just to talk about where they're from, what they're up to, and uh, what they'd love to get into. Sure. Thanks, Aaron. And I'm the community manager at Spreader. So I've been there for almost two years. I come from a journalism background, uh, worked at a PR agency for a little bit. Uh, so now my days are taken up with everything Spreader and online media. And I also do some writing on the side for Blog TO and Women's Post. Okay, I'm Alex. I've just come to Toronto from Australia. I've created and exited a few technology companies and now I consult with Helix. Uh, so generally now, instead of the marketing, I also do the top-level Web 2.0 strategy for most of the banks, telcos, and companies like that in Canada. Uh, Joseph Pupolo, I've been uh, in both the B2B and B2C space. I've been doing a lot uh, right now with a company called Open Apps, to which I'm the director of uh, marketing community. Been focusing a lot on just uh, social media strategy, growth strategies, and how to get your brand out there with uh, very little. Uh, Mark Evans, I could tell the full story, but you can go to my website, markevans.ca. Uh, Good spent plug. More, yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, I spent more than 10 years as a technology reporter with the Globe and Mail, uh, Bloomberg, and the National Post. Uh, I've done three startups, uh, well, three and a half, including Sysmos. Uh, none of them had made me rich and famous, which I am. You're famous. Uh, well, not rich, but, uh, <laughs> and uh, so now I do digital marketing and uh, social media, so I've worked with a lot of startups trying to help them figure out who they are, why people should care about who they are, and then how to tell their stories to a variety of uh, constituencies. So you know what, I'm, I'm going to change this up. First of all, I just want to announce the, uh, the Twitter hashtag, it's uh, uh, Mars LCA for Lights, Camera, Action, so you remember it, and if you forget, just look for the title there, Mars LCA. Um, I'm going to actually, I'm dying to ask Mark uh, a little bit about the, the Sysmos acquisition, but more as it relates to having just been freshly in a startup, and, and you had a little bit of an operational role there as well. I mean, you were in the, in the trenches, as, uh, as, as many of you have probably, how many people had heard about the Sysmos acquisition uh, by MarketWire? Uh, a very nice exit. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you learned as you went back in and, and about that ride? Uh, well, to give you some context, uh, Sysmos came out of uh, three years of research at U of T. So it was the typical university professor and the really super smart PhD student. And they worked together on uh, data mining and analytics and came up with a product uh, in late 2008. So when I joined them, there were the, only the two of them, and they were working out of separate offices at U, at U of T, so they were about 100 feet from each other. Um, and it took them about eight or nine months to actually get an office. Um, and I guess if I had to sort of encapsulate why they were so successful, it was the right product, um, the right um, time, and the right place. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of startups, um, including the ones that I've been involved in, you can have a great product, but if it's the wrong time, you're too early, you're too late, you're mm -hmm. done. And I felt like, in hindsight, after they were purchased, that I felt like I was in the eye of the hurricane. Uh, that you just felt like, it was a situation where the sales guys didn't have to sell the product. The, mm. the business kept coming in. And the biggest problem they had was actually they didn't have enough time in the day to manage all the demos and all the purchases. Um, so I, I, I would call it a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But mm. it's just some of it's luck, and some of it's just sort of having smart people developing the right technology. You know, I really want to get into this, because this came up in uh, an earlier interview when we did some pre-roll interviews um, with Alex. and. Alex's first thing that, that he said was the whole notion of the product sucks, all the promotion in the world isn't going to work. And I, I think this is something we really have to talk about in some detail, which is value proposition, um, as it relates to the ability for your promotional dollar to actually work. And I'd love to get some thoughts. Alex, you want to maybe talk a little bit about that and maybe some even contemporary experience of people that have wanted you to move product when you've had that issue? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, he, he kind of took the comment to start with, which you can't put lipstick on a pig. If you've got a bad product, it's going nowhere no matter how good you are at marketing. And even if you've got a good product, it, there has to be a benefit there. And it can't just be a marginal benefit. And that's what I find a lot of especially tech startups do, is it's a very quick iteration. And that iteration is good, but it's not good enough for me to swap from what I'm currently using. And I think that's something that we often miss. When it comes to contemporary examples of 
you know, trying to push something, trying to think, I think a lot of the new telcos that are launching are having that problem because I don't know if anybody else catches the subway, I can't drive here because it's the whole other side of the road thing, is <laughs> they've got their prices just listed all over the subway. And to me, that says that they're not hitting their value proposition right. They're all competing on price right now. And to me, that's the silliest thing you could possibly do. So let's throw it open um, in terms of trends. Anything um, that's shifted in the past uh, year from a point of view of promoting uh, web startups? And as you see some of these trends that I've been talking about and you know, formative things that are happening from a media perspective. Aaron, do you want to start us off on that? What's the most profound thing you've seen in the past year well, that we have to react to? The most popular thing that everyone's talking about is location-based services. You know, every startup you see is blank, uh, you know, in my area, or you know, it's all about. But I, I tend to take the stance of localization over location-based because I think the best trend that's come out of location-based services is the ability to find uh, businesses, products, services, and people in your specific area. So, for mm -hmm. example, uh, Meetup.com did something great called Meetup Anywhere, where they allowed people to uh, congregate around one event on a specific day, but in their Area, so I think Seth Godin had, you know, big marketing blogger. He had a Seth Godin tweet ups all over the world, and it was facilitated by Meetup.com. Well, that's great because then you get to connect over one overarching idea, but with people in your local area. Other startups that are taking advantage of that are sites like PlanCast.com, which is a really big up and coming. Um, what are you doing and where are you going? Site that just very simple uh, UI and just allows you to share your plans, but they just added a local section. So now not only can I follow what you know Robert Scoble and some of these big tech heavy hitters are doing out in Silicon Valley, but I can now discover and find events in my own area, which is sometimes difficult. So mm -hmm. you know I, I think we've beaten Foursquare and, and Gowalla and some of these sites to death, but I think the interesting trend for businesses is, okay, great, as a marketer, I can now find people in my area a lot easier and, uh, you know, I might not want to market on Foursquare, but I can use these services to con actually connect with consumers in my area and, and get out and meet them. Mm -hmm. And the Groupons of the world as well. But one of the, um, I guess one of the things that I'm sort of obsessed with these days is, is the idea of uh, influence. Um, so it wasn't that long ago, from a marketing perspective, as a lot of uh, companies were focused on quantity. So how can I attract as many followers as I can, or as many fans as I can, or as many likes? And now the conversation has really shifted, or the focus has shifted. So, so who are the opinion <coughs> leaders, and who are the influencers out there that can spread the word on my behalf? So I can basically allocate my marketing resources in a more efficient way and get everybody else to do the grunt work for me. So it's a friend tells a friend tells a friend theory. Um, and I was talking um, with um, two startups before today, and we're talking about how to get the word out. And, and it really comes down to targeting uh, the people who you think are going to tell your story in a really good way. Um, and so, you know, I was at a, at a conference yesterday about um, social media measurement, and influence is a dominant theme these days. Uh, and I think that's going to be um, a key thing that a lot of startups are going to have to focus on in terms of really maximizing their, their marketing clout. Is there anything that you're seeing from a technology point of view? We'll talk more about technology on the panel, but uh, in terms of tracking influencers and, and analytics in that area. So uh, social media monitoring uh, is table stakes right now. Uh, I think everybody knows the benefits of, of monitoring conversations and engagement. Mm -hmm. And I think we're moving beyond that. Sentiment is getting a lot of attraction these days. One of the problems with sentiment, it's very um, it's a very complex and sophisticated problem to be solving. I think location is going to be huge in terms of where do people actually exist. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we have a lot of blogs, but as far as, as uh, a lot of these uh, monitoring tools are concerned, we all live in California because that's where our blogs are hosted. Um, and then the other thing um, um, essentially is, is, is going to be um, giving people the intelligence so that they can do stuff with all the things they're monitoring. So it's one thing to get a tool that tells you, oh, well, you've been mentioned on Twitter a hundred times. So what? What does that mean? I don't, what do I do now, right? Um, and how does that affect my strategic and tactical approaches? And I think that's going to be a huge thing as well. I think, I think speaking specifically to the approach there, I mean, one of the things that's happening in the way of influencers and it's still early stages is people are going back to the same influencers across the board for, uh, for everything. Right. So, I mean, we haven't, we haven't reached, I think, a critical mass from the standpoint where you have people that are individual subject matters and experts that you can go to them in terms of either the physical uh, location or subject matter expertise and 
because they still go back to who is the person with uh, 30,000 followers and that's going to be the per first person I go to whereas it's not necessarily necessarily the right person from an influence uh, standpoint but the, the other half hasn't caught up with that equation. Well, one of yeah. the things they talked about yesterday uh, about influence was that when we're all reaching out to the same kind of people, they're all talking to the same people. It's like a club, right? And so one of the theories that, that they're talking about is how do you get sort of the fringes of the network? <clears throat> and those are people that may not have a lot of followers or, for that matter, a lot of influence. But if you can identify them and they can spread out to their networks, then you can spread your radius mm -hmm. of, of distribution. And I think that's going to be a big challenge. And if somebody can solve that, I think that'll... Uh, it's got more resonate. geometry as opposed to the same tribe all the time. Right. The same messages. Yeah. There are a few upcoming companies now that are trying to track these packs as they move. But when it comes to tracking influence, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what startup you're in, your job is to be selling something. Mm -hmm. And I find everybody's really big on tracking these funnel metrics, but not how much it's actually selling. Mm -hmm. And if it's not selling... Us, uh, no, you go. Do you, do you want to maybe walk us through how you deprogram clients when they come in going, you know, I mean, in the old days it was, well, in the old days, you know, I want to be in, on the, in the New York Times in, you know, traditional PR, or I want to be at, uh, you know, Jupiter on the podium in New York at a big conference. And, you know, now it's changed to, you know, I want, I want to build this amount of uh, weight on social media at the gate. And it becomes a quantitative matter. And sure, they're setting metrics, but you know, what do you have at the back end? What are some of the questions you guys walk uh, clients through, and uh, and also your own team through in some ways, in terms of a better understanding how to think about what those goals and objectives are as they relate to uh, a startup? Well, the first thing I especially say with clients is I get so many that say I want a Twitter. I say why? Because yeah. everybody else has one. That doesn't matter. You need to sit down and go. What am I going to use this for first before we even set up a profile? Mm. There are only three or four decent uses, which is selling something, taking an ease off customer support, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Once you've done that, then the metric is if it's selling something, how much did I sell? If it's customer support, how many tickets did I sell, and was it faster? Just you know, so that solving tickets isn't worth it. It has to be faster for it to be worthwhile. Anything relative to platforms in terms of uh, you know, what some platforms are particularly good at? I mean, one of the things we're seeing now is we've got four generations online now that we're selling to in consumer markets. So when we think about that dynamic, are there, <clears throat> I know there's no hard rules. I think we're all in this together learning. When you think of online, what, uh, w let's take Facebook as an example. On Facebook, where, where do you see the actual target uh, being in terms of the type of uh, products that are best sold in there and the applications versus uh, LinkedIn, for instance? Well, I don't know if it's the right product as much as the right people that you want to hit. Because, the, I mean, I do quite a lot of Facebook ads and different people click the ads and behave differently. Right. And I find a lot of people go on Facebook to hit the younger people, and that's wrong. It's the older people that I hit on Facebook, firstly because they may not realize that they're clicking ads, but they're also not overexposed to them. The younger people, Facebook's old. I mean, I probably check it once every two weeks now. Well, mm -hmm. maybe you can take a step back. Um, because I don't think the discussion is sort of Facebook specific or Twitter specific. Yeah, because I, I think was just that, starting yeah. with some platforms. Yeah, but I think that a lot of companies, <laughs> yeah. when they come to social media, they think, well, I, I got to do it all. I got to be on Twitter. I got to yeah. be on Facebook. I have to have a blog. It's I a balanced be. marketing program. And sometimes, <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, maybe you can call it balanced. But I think the reality is you got to figure out what tools are best suited to get the job done. And to Alex's point, you know, meeting your sales or marketing objectives. And so, from some companies, Facebook is useless. Right. It has no relevance to what they do in the target audiences, and the same could go for Twitter, for example. Mm -hmm. um, some companies, may their most powerful tool may be a blog, because it's the content engine that will fuel their newsletter, that will um, allow them to send value-added information to potential customers or, or white papers and things mm -hmm. like that. So I think part of Alex's point about the why when it comes mm -hmm. to social media has to sort of include so the what, so what is the best mm -hmm. job for the, to get the job done. How about traditional media? I mean, you come from the traditional media space as a, as a journalist, um, now a blogger, and then you're a journalist sometimes. I mean, you've got a number of personas. How do you, um, how do you guys see reaching traditional media uh, these days? What's the art to that these days in terms of how media are using social media, for instance, to research stories and understand what direction they want to take with coverage? I guess I can speak to this because I used to be at a PR agency and what I really hated about PR is that it was all 
you know, reaching out to journalists you didn't know to pitch a product you didn't care about and really, you know, only doing it because you were going to have someone breathing down your neck to ask you about results. And I always hated that approach and that's one of the reasons I left. And I love, you know, I would say I do public relations now, but I do it more from a community aspect. So if I'm going to pitch a story, I'm going to find out what the person actually writes about, if they even write about what I'm writing about or what I, I'm talking about, and view it as more of a relationship-based thing. You know, for example, last week we were Sprouter was featured in Now Magazine. Well, I met Joshua Eret, the the tech editor for Now Magazine. Mm -hmm. I've met him a few times, and for the first time over a year ago, the first time I met him, did I say, "Hey, by the way, I, I work for Sprouter. You should write about us." No, because you know, I, I think traditionally PR people are trained to see journalists and kind of hone in on them and be like, "You need to write about me now," and it's not mm -hmm. like that anymore. It's like, you know what? If they, there's a need, and I come to mind, great. And if not, that's fine too. You know, we can all coexist together online. And in terms of researching stories and stuff, from a from my perspective. Social media is the best tool I have when I'm writing, whether it's for you know blog to or my personal blog, because you can actually bounce story ideas. And I find a lot of journalists, you know, PR people are almost becoming obsolete at agencies mm -hmm. because they don't need to find story ideas through PR emails anymore, PR pitches. They just go on Twitter. I know that's how the best ways I find my ideas are through entrepreneurs getting in touch with me or you know a friend mentioning something to me or showing me the swagger wagon video or whatever it might mm -hmm. be you know those are the things that get talked about not PR pitches anymore. By the way the swagger wagon video was just roll while people were walking in we, we thought it was better than the music that was playing earlier. One of the, uh, <laughs> one of the things I want to add is that uh, you know the dirty little secret when it comes to startups and trying to get a media attention is that traditional media still matters mm -hmm. and it matters it a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. And as much as we want to focus our efforts in getting into TechCrunch and some of those sort of leading blogs is that um, getting media coverage, traditional media coverage is very powerful mm. and very effective. And not to blow Sprouter's horn or anything, but if you read the, the Financial Post on Monday, mm -hmm. was it? A huge feature on the Toronto community scene led by Sprouter and and Sarah and Aaron, and you know the number of people who saw that article that may have checked out. Spread around what your numbers were like on, on Monday. But I mean, if you can get <laughs> if you can get into uh, into the Toronto Star or the Wall Street Journal or the Edmonton Journal or for that the Vancouver Sun, um, that can take you a long way mm -hmm. to get in, in terms of getting your story told. So but let's again, talk. Uh, sorry, you know, not to go on, but uh, you know that a lot of that is community based. We were featured there not because I emailed a press release to the editor there, but because we do engage the community and we do a lot of this social media stuff and community building and that was the story, not a product launch or a company launch or whatever it might be, it was us engaging the community and um, you know, the reporter that wrote that article is a friend and someone mm. that you know, I've known for a long time and, and so you know, I think if you're working at a startup, the best thing that you can do is think about A, the story that you have to tell and B, the people that you need to be meeting and the community that you need to be cultivating to get that story told. Mm -hmm. And you know, you might not know a journalist, but I'm sure people in your network do. You know, their brother might be a producer at Global TV or whatever it is, you know, leverage the network you have to try and get you some of those connections. That's something that I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs miss is that they need to build a pipeline, right, for those key influencers and not necessarily it's not a buy what I have, write a story about what I have. It's it's setting the relationships up and then letting, you know, creating a pull model as opposed to a push your way into a story model. Let's talk about storytelling, because that word came up a lot when we talked earlier in the context of uh, you know, the product's got to be good, there's got to be a value proposition there, but then how you tell your story and how you lay it out in a way that people can then contextually get engaged. Uh, Alex, you want to start us off on that? I know, Mark, you've got some ideas. You know, the first thing is, when you're telling a story, uh, just a little bit of a rail here, if you tell me the startup name once and I can't spell it, then something's wrong. Mm -hmm. I I'm a pretty good speller, at least I like to think so. The second thing is the story shouldn't take, in my opinion, more than 30 to 45 seconds to take, especially on a first meeting. And I should understand why I'd want to use the thing, not because it's cool, because it's fun, because everybody else is there, but what meaty value do I get? We've got that problem a lot. We've got all of these other new startups, like Good Group Spawn that Joseph was telling me about. Um, apparently, if you get married on Groupon, you win a prize. So if anybody wants to get married, come and talk to me. <laughs> He's got the ring. It's nice. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but there's no meaty value there. And I think that's one thing we miss when we do our elevator pitch. I think also, sorry to jump in, but uh, you often think your story is one thing and the audience or the journalist or whoever you're marketing to 
we'll see something completely different. And mm -hmm. that's the case with us. You know, we went out, you know, Canadian startup trying to connect entrepreneurs around the world. That was our story. Well, no, the story that the media picked up on was entrepreneur had a failed venture, found she had no network there, and so built one for herself. And literally, the day we launched, the headline in the National Post was uh, sprouting out of failure, or lessons in failure. And Sarah was like, oh great, I'm on you know, the cover of a national newspaper talking about my failure. But that was the story that people resonated with because entrepreneurs everywhere, and people everywhere, like to know that you can have a failure and it's okay, you can get back and dust yourself off. And sometimes that can be the biggest inspiration. So you know, maybe tell your story to a few people and say, or ask them, what do you think of when you think of me? What does it bring to mind? And, and is, is the story that I'm telling you the same as what you would think of me and get your messaging right? I think it also really matters if it's uh, who the personality is that it's coming from. Like going back to the PR discussion in terms of like traditional PR in terms of pitches out there. I mean, social media also gives a unique opportunity for just an individual to have a personal discussion with someone and really r relate to them. So, I mean, I think when you're doing that storytelling, I mean, use your own personal story as, uh, as part of your advantage rather than it coming off as like a clean, uh, polished 45-second pitch. I mean, the story that you have to tell is is obviously important, but I mean, use part of the, the fact that the, your story behind you to really leverage that. Well, I think that uh, when I started my business, I, I, I thought about calling myself a social media guru. That didn't work. And <laughs> social media expert, I thought that was a bit ostentatious. But I mean, I, I, and I thought about actually calling myself a storyteller. I mean, because that's basically what I help companies do is they have great stories inside, but they're terrible at telling them mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. And I think that once you establish your core story, then the key is then... Um, identifying your target audiences and creating personalized versions for each of those stories. So sometimes it's the scrappy startup that emerged from failure, and sometimes it's two young women entrepreneurs who have sort of gone against the grain, and sometimes it's the value of networks. I mean, whatever the story for the target audience is, there's not a single story that you tell. There's different slices of the same story depending on what you think is going to resonate with the particular target audience. Especially if you're looking at, you know, a, a more of a human interest story to talk about an entrepreneur's journey, for instance, or a company's journey. They want to see, you know, various uh, plot lines and, you know, it, it can't all be smooth sailing. There's got to be some intrigue in there. I think that's good. I mean, something I learned uh, from Dave Gray, I was blessed to actually have worked with him a couple of times from X-Plane, and he always talks about the pain and the gain and the who and the do. Who's in the scene? What are they doing? And break it down in terms of going out and, and really giving people a good understanding of how that product interaction is working. And something that is a good part of storytelling for top people like Dave, and we're learning more about um, the art of telling that visually as well. That's a really key part of, uh, of actually getting complex products out for people, whether it's social or traditional media, or even consumers in general. They've got to understand the storyboard. It's like a visual storyboard that you've got to connect with people. Because as the technology gets more complex, it's actually more important that we complement it with those <coughs> stories and graphics. Um, I want to throw uh, some questions out to the audience as well and make this as interactive po as possible. Do we have anybody that's got any questions for this star-studded panel here? <laughs> We've got one in the back here, and we're just gonna we're just gonna get you mic'd if that's okay. We're gonna bring a mic over to you. <coughs> Sorry, you have your head up in the back. I lost track. <laughs> Thank you for playing. Hi. Um. Uh. Just about um, Alex's comment about uh, you know. Well, I, I agree with the one. If you can't if you can't spell the name of the the startup, then I mean that just creates problems right off the bat. But in terms of uh, the 30, 30 or forty five second elevator pitch. Why is that the litmus test? And I know, I mean, are we really, really that busy? Our retention spans have gotten that small? Because, and let me just provide some examples of things that are not maybe, not, not ubiquitously considered important in society, but it, I mean, there's enough people who think there's importance to it. Uh, maybe not businesses, but like there's a large hadron collider. Really hard to explain to someone why we actually want to smash particles together, you know, to explore uh, questions in subatomic physics. There's the, the long form census, which is more of a Canadian thing right now, but it's a very nuanced conversation to explain why this is important. Um, if you can't, I mean, is, is, is that it? Is it hit or miss if you can't summarize your idea in 45 seconds? I, I think there's two reasons that I say that. And obviously for subatomic 
yada yada, it's absolutely irrelevant. The first thing is, it's not so much because I don't have the time, but to see if you can articulate it so simply, because if it's that complicated, it's just going to be a disaster now and a disaster later. And the second reason is when you get to a level where you're raising money and pitching important people, yeah, that is all you're going to get on a first meet. I agree. Sorry, I go to a lot of networking events and a lot of conferences, and you have, I would even argue, 15 seconds when you meet someone to say what your business does. If you can't say it in one sentence, you need to sit down and think about your value proposition because when you meet someone, you're going to say, hi, I'm Aaron and I X, and they're not going to listen to a 30, 45 second pitch, especially at an event with a lot of people. The, uh, I, I would say absolutely. Um, in fact, a lot of the exercises I do with companies is essentially trying to create their about us and trying to tell people in three paragraphs what they do. Um, just as a sort of a tip, there's a, a guy named Steve Krug, and it's K-R-U-G, and he writes amazing user-friendly books on usability um, and messaging. So if you are a startup and you're looking for a book to buy, and I would totally recommend it. I just finished the first of the two books that he's published and was like, it's one of those notes you write in the column, you know, you're writing notes all the time. Um, so a must buy for any startup if you're interested in messaging and, and uh, UX. And what was the name of the book? It escapes me, but it's, if you, <laughs> if you do, if you do, if you just, do you know the it's, it's not rocket surgery. Is that's the, the one, and the other one is right. Don't Tell Me, something, I think or it's don't, don't, make me think. don't Make Me Think, that's it, yeah, it's a, it, they're great books. Yes. If I can just point out as well, we're talking about storytelling, but it's not always right to tell the story straight away, and I'm sorry to make this public, but when Aaron and I first met, we had, I think it was a week-long oh, email we conversation <laughs> on how I could starve myself to eat more food at the Mandarin Buffet, mm -hmm. and that conversation went for a week, but it built that relationship to a point where I could probably pitch anything to her and she would have taken my call. And oftentimes, you know, people always say, oh, Twitter, it's just about what you had for lunch. But I laugh because the things that you resonate with people about are the simple things. They're, you know, about my mittens not working with my iPhone. And they're about <laughs> stupid things that, and stupid problems that other tech people have or anybody in general. And those are the things you resonate over. So it's not always your company pitch that's going to be drawn out of you right at the beginning. And that's when you can get into the five, ten minute pitch over a cup of coffee when you actually get to know the person. But with an investor at a conference, you know, Jason Calacanis, I've seen him walking around at conferences and there's a lineup of about 20 people waiting to talk to him. So when you get your turn, are you going to have a 15 second pitch ready? Because you'll need to. But, but it even goes beyond like pitching to people, whether it be PR or investors or things like that. I mean, people are so saturated with so many different media. I mean, and we'll use a Twitter analogy to uh, the 45 second. If you can't get it out in 140 characters, well, then you have some problems in terms of being able to articulate your pitch in this, in this context because it's just, it has become hyper-competitive and you have to be able to articulate it quickly. But you know, I'm always amazed by it. You think it's a simple proposition for startups because it's some, you're immersed in, in this thing and you create this vision and you have a mandate for your product and they have such a hard time clearly articulating what they do and why anybody would care. Um, and sometimes I think the answer is, is, uh, is outside perspective. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You're drinking so much of the Kool-Aid every day and you're so immersed in your project that sometimes you really have to get your mother or your cousin or somebody off the street to basically say, what do you think? You know, does, it, does it resonate with you? And sometimes they'll tell you, well, not at all. Maybe your story is this. Um, so it's, sometimes it's good to get out of the sort of... I'm glad you said that because I was, I was going to build on that and, and talk about metaphors because that's usually what somebody with outside perspective starts to get into. Oh, so it's like such and such. So it's, it's like Star Wars. It's like trying to explain a movie to somebody, a pitch, and saying, oh, well, it's, it's kind of like Buffy the Vampire Slayer meets Star Wars. Oh, yeah, exactly. I got it. Yeah, we can finance that. That's how Hollywood kind of works in a way. You have to use these kind of metaphors. And in fact, there's a number of guys out there uh, in the Valley that say they want to see a Hollywood style pitch that sort of brings those two elements together. If you start using metaphors, it gets very powerful. But the question I'd have for you guys, just to build on this, because it is a great question actually. We are kind of in this pitch society and it's, uh, it is the, the blink test essentially, right? It's, it's what Gladwell's talked about in terms of you, nobody has a lot of time to form an opinion. And that's why I think a lot of TV is getting all that more shocking and, and we're starting to regress in some ways in, in consumer society. And, and because of that regression, a lot of people are, are, are following <laughs> that uh, trend. But what do you think about pitches in general? Can everything, even a Hadron Collider, be, be dumbed down enough so that people can get it? 
within that 140 characters or 15 seconds? I'd say it comes down to the audience because I don't need to understand that or why it functions, at least from what I understand. But let's take any, can, can almost theoretically, do you think anything can be dumbed down? Yes. I do. Yeah. There's, a, there's a website. I promise you, don't do it at work because you'll spend an hour on it. But it's, the URL is it's thisforthat.com. And well, now we've lost I went our on audience. <laughs> and I went on this website and I just died laughing because it's exactly what Mark was talking about. You know, startups cannot articulate what they do, and so they have to put analogies on it. So it's Facebook for construction workers. It's you know, uh, Groupon for new moms. Like it's, great. it's really and it just repopulates with different. Uh, well, what's that again? Polar, it's, it's this for that dot com. This for that. It's oh, not, smartphone. you can't help it to get your startup messaging, you'll just laugh. But it's still, it's funny though, because it's true. Everybody has to put something on it. And for us at Sprouter, we've had the unfortunate tag of it's Twitter for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as much as we're not that, we're a resource and we do a lot more than just that. If that helps people understand a little bit of what we do and the idea behind it, which is connecting entrepreneurs similar to how Twitter connects anybody around mm -hmm. the world, I'm fine with that. If you want to think we're a niche Twitter for entrepreneurs, you go right ahead. And once you visit Sprouter.com, because the real goal here is just catching your attention, getting you to check out the site, and then you realize, oh, okay, they also have a weekly publication. They also do a Q&A site. They also do offline events. Whatever it might be, your value prop will become evident. And I think it comes down to what Alex said. You know, if, if you can't put lipstick on a pig, you can have a great pitch, but as soon as someone goes to your website, they're going to see what you really do, and they're going to see all of what you do, and if that's interesting to them and that's valuable, they're going to stay. But I 100% believe that even the Large Hadron Collider could be described with an it's this for that. Yeah, yeah. pretty great. But being a fan of the Big Bang, Big Bang Theory show, I yeah. actually know what the Hadron Collider is. And I mean, what, the, what, what I would say back to you in terms of the pitch for that is, I mean, they're, they've built a machine to try and unravel the mysteries of the universe. So the, the, there, if you go with the, that simple line of the pitch, it sort of makes someone take pause and go, okay, well, uh, how does it unravel the mysteries of the universe? And then, then, you, then you have a chance for the second bit of discussion and actually build the, the back and forth. Can you get Star Wars characters into the metaphor? Somehow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd also just point out that with the metaphors, to be very, very careful with them, as Aaron said, they unfortunately have the tag of Twitter for entrepreneurs. And the way you tag yourself, especially now that we're getting this fatigue of I'm the four square of this or I'm the group on for that, detracts a lot of people. And, and I hate to admit it, but when I first came to Canada, I didn't visit Sprouter because I heard it was the Twitter for entrepreneurs. It wasn't until I sat down, I think it was with Soul for Coffee, and he said, no, check it out. That's not just what it is. So be very careful with the label you give. Any other questions from the audience? I've got another. Um, yes? Uh, is it okay to get a little bit technical? Uh, well, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> Let's drop the I, I want some technical advice. So we were talking a little bit about influence, and I'm currently trying to develop, develop an affiliate program. <laughs> Um, so to actually embed some content into some influencers' websites. And was wondering if we could speak a little bit about the technology that you guys would recommend. Um, considering iframe, but I've heard there are some issues with that. And was wondering if you guys could touch a little bit on the other options. So, um, I'll jump in. I've been doing a lot with uh, Commission Junction in some of my previous lives. I would probably say they're uh, the leading uh, affiliate company out there. I mean, uh, you don't have to use an iframe with that. It's a simple JavaScript uh, include. Uh, there's a lot of uh, resources both on the integration side that you can talk to them and get various different ideas on, on how to work with them. Sorry. Um, but the main issue there, you have to have a minimum of $50,000 in revenue from my understanding. So if you're you know, if you're at the beginning of this phase, you almost have to develop an in-house program to then approach them in a little that, bit of time. That still is a requirement for CJ, I think, is, is the minimum. You have to have a certain number of months in business and, and a certain amount of revenue. Um, that's, I think they still have that rule, and, and they're okay. a premium network, right? Have you seen the book Affiliate Millions? No. It's actually great, um, and I'd recommend that because it, it goes through all the different affiliate programs and it's from a guy that's actually made millions in affiliates. I know it's a tacky title, but he does a really good job taking you through um, a benchmarking. And, and you know, it, I would say it's probably outdated now, but it gives you a lot of the principles in terms of how you need to benchmark the various programs out there. And that's a pretty fast-changing area right now with mobile and such. 
Right. So I, I, don't, I, I don't profess to be up on it, but that, I can lend you the book if you like. It's hard to find. Oh, that would be awesome. Google, I'm happy to do that. Google Affiliate Network is another one. I mean, they're, little, uh, they're pretty black box in terms of what, what they, uh, I mean, you send something in and you're not sure what you're going to get back from, uh, from them, to be, uh, to be perfectly honest. It's like on. search. <laughs> and, and I guess, I mean, tracking it is, is, one, is definitely one side. I'm most interested in the best technology to embed content from one website to another. Mm. Um, and we can talk about it after, but yeah. sure. I, I mean, one of the things I wanted to just to change the channel slightly, and it's a, it's a an important question for a lot of the entrepreneurs we see here at Mars coming in, wanting to uh, develop just a, a baseline marketing program from a promotional point of view. They don't have a lot of budget. We'll assume that. Um, when you start to think about talent, when they're bringing on a consultant, or or they might even be doing that first hire on the marketing side. That marketing person obviously needs to know how to do promotion. Um, and all of those, uh, all, a number of those other things that we've talked about to date. When you think about talent, the notion of talent is changing. And if anybody hasn't read the HubSpot white papers on this, they've been really great as a thought leader talking about the kind of people that need to be inside a marketing organization or in start the, inside a, a startup now. Uh, with the advent of social media especially. It's a whole different set of skills that you're looking for. They're not standard PR type skills because you're usually not just working with traditional media. When you make that first hire, what, what's going through your mind in terms of skill sets that you would want to see for that person? Aaron, do you want to start off? You're a community manager, so you have a lot of this nailed already in terms of skill set. Yeah, well, I'm, I've never hired someone, I have to admit. So we're a team of four, so yeah. I don't hire developers. But uh, actually, if, you were if I was, well, it's a good question. Aaron Burry is hiring us. Yeah, <laughs> tell everyone you know. Um, no, but I actually read inbound marketing, if you guys are looking yeah. to get into SEO, which I didn't know a ton about. So it, it, uh, SEO, as well as kind of stuff you should be looking for while you're hiring. Inbound marketing by Dharmesh Shaw and Brian Halligan is an amazing uh, book and you know you can also give it to your mom after because there's chapters on kind of Twitter and Facebook for beginners and that kind of thing but <laughs> it had a really interesting chapter about bringing on the right kind of talent and they had a set of questions that you should be asking of potential hires and I thought it was so great because typically you just hear do you have a Twitter account do you have a blog and they took it a step further and said you know, how many tweets do you have and what's your follower to following ratio? Um, you know, what platform is your blog on and why do you prefer that over, over other platforms? You know, what SEO have you implemented on your site and what analytics have you done to make sure that, you know, your content is optimized? And, you know, I think those are the questions that you need to be asking of new hires. Now, I come from the belief system and I know that Mark comes from a separate one, so he might be able to counter this, but I believe that, you know, as long as you have a strong background in communications and some basic knowledge of social media, you don't need a ton of experience to succeed as a community manager because as long as you hire someone smart who's willing to learn and get out there on the ground and, and you know keep up on new technologies, they're gonna learn quickly and you know it doesn't take a rocket scientist to run a Twitter account. You know, it's more about can they engage with people? Are they outgoing? Can they walk into a room of strangers and shake hands? Can they write? Can they you know do messaging, that kind of thing? So I believe you know if you can get a new grad who's really passionate about this stuff and smart, it's not always as necessary to have the experience in place. Let me take a, a different mm -hmm. tactic. Um, uh, although Aaron and I like to spar on the experience <laughs> angle. Uh, so it, it, for a lot of startups, it comes down to the, the kind of person you need at the right stage of the development. So for my first startup called Blanketware, I came on, uh, I left the Globe and Mail, where I was a technology reporter, and I came on as sort of the communications and marketing guy. We didn't even have a product. Like they didn't, I had nothing to do. I remember. Because there was nothing, yeah, there was the nothing to market and there was nothing to communicate about. So basically I was bored silly and, and eventually I fired myself because we were running low on cash. Um, so that's the one thing. So figure out um, what you need when you need it. So a lot of marketing is a very sexy uh, person to hire. Same goes with uh, community managers or social media people, but you may not need them when you think you do. So that's my first piece or of advice. Or full time. Or full time. So, uh, so the second thing is, um, is then um, figure out whether you need to hire full time or part time. Um, a lot of the things that I do for clients are on a project basis because they, they, they can't afford me, they don't want to hire me full time, and they don't need me more than like a few weeks. They need a project done. Mm -hmm. And third, and this is probably my biggest piece of advice for startups, is hire people who are multidimensional. 
hmm. who are utility people as opposed to really, really good at one thing. Because when you're working with a startup and you've got a staff of four or ten, you want people who can wash the dishes and dry the two. dishes and, yeah, <laughs> and, and a dog. <laughs> and, but you want people who can who basically can do um, uh, social media one day and write your personal at least the next day and then right. do some business development the next day and then sell a client the next day. Um, and you want them to work like dogs because that's what working for a startup is all about. Um, but you want them to be multifunctional. Okay, so that, that's a good tweet right there. That's what a startup is all about, working like dogs. <laughs> no, great. <laughs> no, but I think the point about being multifaceted is really, really important, especially, I mean, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with agile development and constantly changing uh, product based upon what, what you have to pivot to, what's going on in the market, but having that person who's, who's very good, who's able to speak to people on the tech, uh, technical side, I think is is really vital in being able to then communicate what that pivot is back out to the, the marketplace and keep on iterate, um, continuing to iterate. And I guess the only thing I look for when I'm hiring, and like Aaron, I'm not, uh, <laughs> is have they consistently been very quick to learn something? And that doesn't mean a degree or high school, but are there a lot of pivots in their own career? Because to me, that shows somebody who's not even still figuring out, but is just interested in a lot of different things. And that's really what you need. Let's talk, um, any other questions from the audience? Just, uh, yes, we'll get a mic over there. Actually, we've got one in the back and then we'll take you in a second, thank you. Uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, I know we talked a bit about uh, you know, promotional channels, taglines to use, but if I may, I'd just like to take a, take a bit of a step back and just talk a bit about, uh, or rather get your thoughts or philosophies about how to name your product or how to name your company what sort of logos should you have? You know, I've been hearing, reading articles about, you know, flashy logos versus just keeping it simple, mm -hmm. or you know, having names that are very pertinent to your product versus having names that are completely random. So I just wanted to get your thoughts and philosophies around how one should go about naming their products or have flashy logos or mascots around that. Wow, how much time do we yeah, have? Really, it's, <laughs> it's a good to question. Say, though. To jump in there first, only because. Um, we actually learned a really important lesson today about, uh, about naming. So for anyone that doesn't know, our company used to be called Redwire. And we rebranded as Sprouter last summer due to some URL issues and that kind of stuff. But nobody knew what Redwire was. Like my mom, my friends they were like, is it a dating site? Is it a travel site? I'm like, no, that's Hotwire. Well, what is Redwire? Like it didn't bring to mind businesses or growth or networking or any of those kinds of things. And Sarah, our founder, CEO, obviously liked the idea a lot, so ordered about $20,000 worth of stickers, pens, Ouch. postcards, anything and everything that could be swagged to give out at a conference. And so we had the lovely task today of recycling about $20,000 worth of promotional materials because uh, we were moving stuff out of the basement in our building. And it was a great lesson that you can't marry your idea from day one. You know, If you think you have a great logo or a great name, you might not, or you might have issues with it. So no matter what you choose, don't order swag yet. And you know, in terms of rebranding, you know, I remember sitting in the back room of our office coming up with names, and we did it in a very sophisticated manner. Uh, it might get too technical for you. We took giant post-its, and we wrote prefixes and suffixes and words we liked, and we started matching them up on the wall, and literally came up with a list of about 20 business names, and they were all Web 2.0-y, so they were either missing a letter or adding a letter or missing a vowel or whatever it might be. But you know, we eventually came up with Spreader, and now looking back, I can't imagine it being anything else. But at the time, you, know, you don't know what the right name is. You don't know what's going to be associated with your brand. So what we did was sent out a ton of surveys. My advice to you is come up with 10 names, send them to your mom and your dentist and your friends from high school, to anybody that is not in your industry or your sphere. Ask them what they like best and get feedback on it and work with people. And in terms of logos, cute animals. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> well, I would say that. Seriously. I, I would say that hey, rule number one is don't pay an external agency to come up with a cool name for you. So when I was at Blanketware, we paid $30,000 for an agency. It was a dot com boom, right? We, yeah. we were going to be flowing in money. And it was, <laughs> and these people came in and they were all wearing black, you know, they were super cool. And, uh, you know, they, they, glasses. they, yeah, and they flashed Can you these name names. agencies? Uh, yeah, no. probably best. And uh, anyway, it was the biggest waste of money we ever did. I, I'd sooner go the, the, the posted, posted route. route. So that's number one. Um, number two, you know, and logos is really interesting because they're so subjective. 
and there's a really cool site called, I think it's called CrowdSpring. Mm. Um, so you basically say to the crowd, I want to spring for $500 for a new logo. And you get all these people who will bid to win that business. So uh, I have a client who's a construction company. And he, we said, do this, do this. And he was like, really? This guy's like very web 1.0. And he did it. And the logo was amazing. It's like, it's fantastic. And it's 500 bucks. Yeah, nine, 99 Designs is the other one that designs I'm sure one, some yeah. of you have heard of. And that's crowdsourced uh, designers. They do a great job. And you can also run a, a private contest in 99 Designs if you want. If, you, if, you know, if, there's a, if you're in stealth and you don't really want to reveal that, you just pay a little bit more. I, I've had some success on 99 Designs doing stuff. Um, any thoughts? Yeah. Speaking to the name specifically, I mean, especially for web-based startups, it's so important, obviously, to get the, the good uh, domain name and make sure that you can then translate. So when you when you're saying so, uh, something out to someone that will then has the ability of just saying what you said briefly about what your company name is, and then be able to go back to a search engine and find, and re realistically find you. And the other thing I want to oh, want to highlight, and people sort of wondered why I have a like a leopard print snuggie here. Uh, this is I'm giving away to my thousand Twitter follower who might be in this very room. How many do you have left uh, to? Follow I think we're in. Uh, we're under ten. So I'm gonna unfollow you. <laughs> oh. yeah. unfollow you I'll back. give you one for free. So I, I <laughs> but, think but theoretically, we'll we'll have a winner tonight. On this. I, I I think so. So if you got your uh, smartphones, get get to it. But the the point, the other point that I want to bring this up from a naming convention is, I mean, I realize with the whole Web 2.0 boom and even the startup boom, everyone was like, what is the most esoteric name that I can I can give to this? But if I say this, this is a snuggie. Oh. Oh, you you sort of already have an image of in your in your mind as as to what it is and what it, what it does. So I think uh, from a naming perspective, that's really important. Let me, let me ask you a question. Uh, so if there's a name that you totally think fits your company and somebody owns it, how much should you could you should you buy it? It and how much it depends if you have cash. Are you bootstrapping? Do you got cash in the I don't bank? know. Well, I mean, let's say a name is four thousand bucks. For that's name. cheap. Should you buy it? Is it worth it? Relatively, depending upon how you're try, uh, trying it to scale to. It's how strategic it is. I mean, there's so many factors to weigh. I mean, first of all, do you want the .ca or the .com? And I, a lot of people are even arguing over that, whether or not .ca has even got a little bit more allure these days. Question back. So, sorry, did you have a comment? Yes, in relation yeah. to that, um, I've even found that if I found somebody who has the domain, I basically make a year agreement with them to rent it to see if it actually will take off. Or mm -hmm. point. Interesting. You know, so, $500 just a comment from the audience for the for the tape that somebody was saying you could possibly even arrange to rent the name if somebody doesn't want to part from it. Just before the next question too, what a lot of startups don't realize is that you can actually finance domain names through the registrars. Mm -hmm. So if they're on Enom, or I can't remember what the other big one is, um, it's got the horrible blue and green design. GoDaddy. Not GoDaddy, that's even worse. <laughs> yeah. But GoDaddy's what they will do is because they own the domain name and say if it's worth 20000 they only take two or three thousand dollars down, and then they'll just ask you to keep making payments, because all they still own the domain. So if you don't make a payment, they take it back mm -hmm. off you. It's a very easy way to get a good name. It's a great way, and then just put it in as an expense item if it's really hot. I mean, a couple of the other things is it's got to be simple. I mean, it can't be a really long uh, domain, and the domain is always, I think, the first test of a great name. Once you think you've got something, back to what Aaron was saying. The other thing is, is you got to do some global translation. Real quick on Google, the tools are there. If this thing is actually coming up as a, as a, as a naughty word in, in some dialect out there, um, you know, shame on you if you haven't done that, because if you're going to invest in this in any way, it's got to be uh, good. It also has to be extensible. Uh, be careful that you don't sort of get yourself into a corner where um, you can't really build on that as a master brand name if that's going to be your .com site. So remember, there are, there are in branding, again, it's not a course on branding, but there are master brands and then there are extensions, product extensions. You may have a family of brands underneath that website. So Sprouter could, could launch a set of conferences. Uh, I'm not making up product here for Aaron, but I mean, there's a lot of things that Sprouter could potentially do as an entity and would want to potentially um, use that as a master brand, the Sprouter brand. So I encourage you to think a lot about this and um, you know, really just go out there and look from a logo perspective. Your, your question earlier, logo versus uh, um, uh, you know, just a, a word mark, which is the other type of you know, stuff you see. Um, ask a lot of people um, and make sure that you don't just ask friends around the table 
um, get out there and start talking to the segments that you're going to serve. That's really important. Just also, some thoughts. It's very important from SEO and an SEO perspective too. Absolutely. Uh, you know, if, if you think that the perfect name for your company is mint.ca, you're never going to be the number one search result for mint online. So, yeah. you know, do a search for your name, even if you're going to get the, the .ca or, you know, there might be a company in Iceland that has, you know, the first SEO ranking for your company name. So put it into Google and see what comes up against you. and. Uh, and see how difficult it would be for you to actually move up the ranks in the search results. But, al but also doing it not only for brand search results, but, but, but yeah, for, for general search results. So if there's, uh, there's an area that you really want to be in, <clears throat> such as auto parts, for example, like what, what are people going to search on in order to, to find it from a general term? And I'm not necessarily automatically advocating it, but I mean, if you can get that secondary search term uh, it, within the, the brand, I mean, obviously you don't want to undercut the brand while doing so, mm -hmm. but if you can incorporate that, you're, you're that, much, that much better for your SEO tasks. Oh, and just real quick on the mascot thing, it's not a bad idea. I mean, you look at Porter, that's pretty sophisticated branding with a raccoon who's in the scene and, and doing so many activities. Um, the raccoon really represents that sophisticated traveler. It's, it's brilliant um, branding for a consumer market and for a business market as well. So there is something to having a mascot. And one last point on this, make sure, you know, we're not just doing logos to have them at the top of a website. They're actually favicons. We're looking at a whole pile of different ways that you have to iconically represent that brand. So you gotta start looking with your graphic designer as to how it scales across different screen resolutions and sizes. You gotta test this stuff. Otherwise, you find out later after you bought that domain main name for four grand, or God knows you may have even financed it with GoDaddy and you're finding that it's not really working all that well. Or Just you bought $20,000 worth of swag. <laughs> yeah, when, uh, swag sale at Sprouter. Yeah, if you want a red wire sticker, now's the time. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Going fast, folks. Any one, other questions we've got? One really uh, quick tech tip, and I'll leave it with anyone who is working with a designer or is a designer themselves. Uh, make sure that any logo that you put on your, your page is not a background CSS item and is actually an icon that can be used in, uh, in so social media. I've seen, I've seen this far too many times that I have to say this. It has to be forward so it can be social uh, network book, uh, bookmarked. Mm -hmm. Good point. A um, couple more questions back here. Yes, thanks for your patience. I wanted to ask about product actually. Um, promoting the product because obviously you know you don't have a problem if you your product is flying off the shelves however typically what happens is um, it may sort of trickle off the shelf and then maybe they'll fly for a bit and then they'll trickle again and or it'll stop mm -hmm. for a while and then there's going to be like lots of dry spells yeah you, you have like the feast of famine um, phenomenon Do you have a particular category that you're talking about? Any personal experiences that you've had with this so you can give us some yeah, context? Yeah, it's, it's um, well, actually it's like communication and, and training. Yeah. So, you know, and then of course the recession also factors in. Right. So what I want to know is sort of some, you know, thoughts about and ideas uh, about how to promote. How do you promote now? What are you using? What have you looked at? Well, it's, it's sort of a blend of traditional uh, word of mouth, mm -hmm. a little bit of, you know. Are you doing any online? Not a lot. Okay. I, I think that you, uh, and this is particularly uh, applicable to seasonal products or where there's spikes in demand throughout the year and then it disappears, is that you really want to keep the conversations going throughout and you've got to use a bunch of different um, editorial and creative programs to make sure that you're not talking for a month and then disappearing for three months and then talking for a month. Um, it could be a blog that you share thoughts and opinions on. It could be social media activity. Um, it could be Facebook advertising. But I think you've got to keep your foot on the pedal at all times. Um, otherwise, people forget about your product. The marketplace is so noisy right now, and there's just so much competition that out of sight, out of mind. So how, you, you basically have to have a steady presence throughout the year. Yeah, I guess the only other thing is a lot of startups promote, 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 get a job, execute, then realize they've got nothing left. It should be whatever it is, it might be 80% always promoting and 20% executing and never deviate from that. And a lot of people trickle just because they don't take into account that I'm doing work, so I'm not refilling my pipeline right now. Other questions? 
Yes. Um, Mark's got the queuing back there. We're up to five or six. This is good. Um, I just want to ask about kind of the balance between simple messaging and enough content to get strong SEO. And just kind of what your thoughts are on that. I think your messaging online doesn't have to be as simple as we were talking about in person. Um, you know, when you're meeting someone in person, you're not going to deliver your entire About Us section. But when I'm a consumer and I go to your About Us page, I definitely do want to see a bit more content. My advice is to have, always have a little snippet at the top, you know, like about us in one sentence or about us in 140 characters, and then all that messaging below. And again, I mean, if you're creating content like a blog, um, the big thing is for SEO, pick those 10 keywords or words that you want to rank for, and then just continually use them in your titles and your tags, and, uh, and you'll start ranking, and, and you still don't have to be long-winded as long as you're using this consistent uh, voice and, and terms that are That's the key is the key word grading, right? And getting that right and then you can write good content around that. It's a bit of an art. <coughs> Alex, any thoughts on that? The, I mean, there's not too much more I can add. I, the only problem a lot of SEOs have is they SEO their page so much that a human doesn't want to read it anymore. Uh, yeah. Good point. Uh, yeah, I would actually, I would actually maybe go against what Aaron said a little bit, because uh, I think simple messages are very powerful. And I think that if, you, if you're obsessed too much with SEO, when it comes to your messaging, then you'll do a bad job of both. Um, because at the end of the day, the better understood your message is, the more people will talk about you, whether it's on a blog or in social media or virally, uh, and that'll generate the SEO benefits um, that you need. And also, having your website structured properly with the proper meta tags um, also goes a long way in helping the search engines discover who you are. And just from, just from a search engine perspective, I mean, if you already have a large existing site, I would recommend, okay, spending, uh, spending time doing SEO on it. But one of the models, I mean, for, for newer uh, websites that I'm recommending is you spend a lot of time on content creation and you can create a lot of content and then launch with a big site and then, then you're making very little content updates. My re biggest recommendation to you, because one of the things that search engines looks for is just new information to see that the site is uh, is constantly updating, but constantly have a pulse uh, of new information coming up on your website, not d devote so much energy into the big upfront, okay, I've delivered my site, now, now I'm done, and maybe I have a blog with a uh, new article, but it, I'd say better structure your resources so you're constantly coming out with new elements rather than directing everything to one big upfront effort with very little maintenance. Is that helpful at all? I mean, the, other, the other thing I'd add is just, is it the main site or are you looking at some microsites that you're looking to develop and you want to get some backlink action happening? I mean, I, I've seen approaches where companies have, on their microsite strategy, been a hell of a lot more keyword laden and it's a little bit more promotionally oriented and then sort of staying a little bit more interesting and true to form on the, on the main site. But what they're really trying to do is draw traffic in. Uh, and, and still content is king in, in terms of relevance with Google these days. It's what a lot of the better SEO and SEM people are telling me. Um, other questions? Peter, I just want to say thank you for explaining the raccoon, because I would open up the Global Mail and never understand why it's in there. So <laughs> That's funny. Thank you. I still don't like it, but anyways. Well, you like him just a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. So, Porter is his name, by the okay. way. You may not have known that. <laughs> you know too much. So <laughs> looking at, um, my question is, you know, we've gone top down, looked at strategy, which is great. I want to get a little bit more in the nitty gritty, so more on the tactical side. So could you, you know, from your experience, could uh, more on a launch of a new web app, could you give me like top three um, campaigns that have really worked and, you know, in order of ascending cost, like the cheapest of the, nice. yeah, just Good really question. things that you've seen. I think one of the cheapest ways and most effective to, to, to hit a number of different strategies all at different ones is the, is the SEO press release. And I tie that in with, with, with other activities in terms of doing, doing the pro proper press outreach ahead of time, to, uh, tying, it, tying it in with a press release that you then launch out to the, the PR wires because you can do a number of different things. Obviously, you cover off your PR requirement. If you structure the press release correctly, you actually do some good SEO work for you and you'll show up in Google News and you might get ranked higher disproportionately on that keyword based upon the algorithm that whatever's new, newer will go into that. The other, the other thing that's, uh, that's really good is uh, there's tons of blogs out there that are constantly looking for content information. It's a really quick and easy way to generate a ton, a ton of backlinks. That would be one of my sort of gems that I would use. I, I would offer two 
piece of advice. Um, spend the money on a, on a good demo video. Uh, video ranks really high when it comes to SEO, but more important, video can be very viral and it can be multifunctional in terms of serving needs of your users or your investors or your potential partners. Um, in 90 seconds, you can, if you do it well, you can explain your story in such a more powerful way than any beautiful text that I could craft for you. Uh, and second is the power of the report. Um, so HubSpot, for example, has mastered the power of the um, inbound marketing reports, or the reports that basically draw attention to themselves. So one of the smartest things that Sysmos has done from launch to now is create these mini reports about social media activity. So for today, they had one on looking at the, the impact or the behavior of retweets. Got picked up on Mashable, tremendous action on Twitter. And what you're doing is you're not only showing how smart you are or what kind of insight you have, but you're actually putting the spotlight and help getting people to put the spotlight in your own company. So white papers or little flash reports go a long way. People love that stuff. Yeah, if yeah, I, they're Smart cheap. Has done a great job of that. Yeah. That's good. And one other thing to add is we're talking about launching a startup here. So you're not even targeting 100 people. You shouldn't be going for top 20, 30, 40, or 50. And I like to do things like that in person. And while they're not a startup anymore, Sprout and do the Sprout Ups all the time. And that's how I discovered them, by going to the event. So if you know that you only need 20 people and you know that there's a lot of them in Toronto, just get them all out for a beer or a coffee or something like that. And I also think that offline efforts can translate online for launch. Uh, when we launched, we wanted to do something that caught the attention of these so-called influencers or, in our case, just you know, prominent entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship bloggers. And instead of uh, you know, sending them a press release to their inbox, which we knew would be ignored, we went to Loblaws and bought little money trees and tied a card on them with some spreader messaging explaining what we did. And we were in private beta at the time, so an exclusive you know, private beta code for them to check it out. Now, none of them had to tweet about it or you know, take photos of it or anything, but you know, a lot of the people that we sent it to sent us personal emails thanking us, signed up for the site and used it, and more importantly, they talked about it online and got the word out they're using their voice. And the best thing about it was we didn't have to say, hey, tweet about our product. We just did something that was remarkable and that made them want to tweet about it. So I think you know, launching with a splash is always great, and you can do it cheaply in terms of actual cost. I think they were like 10 bucks a tree or something. We might have sent them out to 30 people. So, I mean, obviously you could adjust that for your budget, but you know, think of something creative that ties in with your brand. Sprouter, tree, you know, it fits. If there's, so, and later on that scales, I mean, Grasshopper spent was about 100,000 on something like that and were featured on CBC and Fox and everywhere just by sending journalists chocolate covered grasshoppers. Mm. So you can scale yeah, that idea true. too. This is for a company that is in the VoIP space, mostly SMB customers, right? Uh, so VoIP uh, phone services. Yeah, and um, sorry, just on the video note, I totally agree with you and uh, made a horrific video for Sprouter when we launched that you know, I spoke too quickly and someone accused me of having a Canadian accent, but it showed people what our product did. And uh, you know, I made another one and there's, I just met with um, an entrepreneur in the audience, Andrew from uh, Switch Marketing, they do animated videos and I think that's also something cool to add another level of um, the wow factor is, you know, everyone's making their own videos and if you can kind of have that fun, animated, um, mm. cool touch to it, I always gravitate towards those and watch them first. So. Can, I, can I offer one tip for mm -hmm. video, if you're going to do a video? Don't use your own voice. Everybody, I always yeah. do. Everybody, everybody thinks they have this great, you know, voice that resonates and you can get a professional. You can get a professional, yeah, thank you. <laughs> but uh, you can get a professional voice for three or four hundred dollars. Like somebody who sounds really good. I want to do a shameless plug for Voices.com. I heard about that. Yeah. I needed uh, voice talent for a project for a friend, actually, that I was helping out. Again, it was that cheap. And I, without a word of a lie, 10 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, I wrote the complete script for a 30-second spot. It was actually a, a sorry, 59-second, 60-second demo uh, reel. And by 8 o'clock in the morning, I had three uh, people that had read the script in a broadcast studio because they have them in their homes. And it's a free agent nation these days. So Voices.com is, without question, one of the most unbelievable services, which is really disrupting you know, the, the old model of you know, how agencies needed to go away. And they come back magically a few weeks later with all that stuff produced at much higher cost. Uh, both, uh, well, we selected one, and it was $125 US on PayPal. We paid the person. Uh, 48 hours later after it was the final cut. 
So these services are pretty amazing. You know, between 99designsvoices.com, uh, Mark did a, a panel way back at the Toronto Venture Group uh, breakfast meeting. It must have been, what, five years ago? Mm -hmm. um, and you were talking about just the, the no-cost startup. I mean, we're talking, you know, no to low cost now, where you can really have a lot of the professionalism that uh, companies that are repped by big agencies can have. Uh, the other thing I would just add is, if you have an opportunity to do research, don't squander that. It, journalists, especially the more traditional media, are always looking for new research that's interesting, a new angle, a new study finds. 37% of women think this. That, and you fill it in, I mean, it's very interesting. We see this all the time, but those studies are generally commissioned by corporates but startups can also commission research and go out and do, a, it doesn't require a big end sample. Um, you know, these days we've got all sorts of different survey tools like SurveyMonkey and about 100 others that can help get an end sample fielded very quickly. Run some banner ads on a site that's very similar. Start to do that, but turn some of that marketing effort into uh, research and amortize that marketing cost. Uh, or if you have existing customers, pull them in and do a panel. But I've actually seen you know, companies like Forrester on 30 executives that they, that they survey, then they build uh, a study, and then they release it to the media. It's not a big end sample. It doesn't take a lot. And just to build on how easy that is, I think it was, it was probably two or three months ago. It was a Sunday afternoon. I was bored. At 1 o'clock, I tweeted out a study. Just, you know, do you prefer Twitter, Facebook for buying things? What influences you most? I think within two hours, I had 40-something responses. Right. An hour later, I wrote the blog post, woke up the next morning, I had 300 retweets. And I turned that around in under 12 hours. It's it not a hard thing to do. It tends to be one of the biggest things retweeted is, is research, right? Because it, it Stats, really is yeah, novel. because it's provocative. Right. And if I can steal a Simpsons line, uh, Homer's up there and he's getting gr <laughs> grilled as being part of the leader of the group. And he goes, well... Uh, who, he goes, what are your reports of the, this actually causing more crime? And, it's like, you know, so, and he goes, statistics can be made up to uh, do anything. 70% of people know that. So <laughs> I, uh, people are looking for the, the hook, and people are looking for something interesting or provocative that's different. I mean, TechCrunch has made a living on that. Questions? As we... Uh as we start to wind down here, we've got a few. Yeah, thank you. Um, along the lines of doing things on the cheap, um, so uh, if we could talk budget for a minute. Uh, rather than ask you how much would a startup need, uh, can I ask you what can, for a community manager or a storyteller, what would $5,000 buy me? That's a, that's a loaded question, isn't it? <laughs> um, well, uh, one, one could even it, say, that, is it the wrong question? Uh, <laughs> in terms of going with the number first. Maybe. Um, so let me, can I rephrase the question yes. for you? So for example, depending on your budget, and I'm just talking my, my own world, um, you can either go to a major digital or PR agency to help you with those kind of things, or you can go with a free agent or a freelancer like myself, um, and, and I will give you as good, if not better, service at a much lower price and that's not a sales pitch, but it is, I guess. Yeah, um, just being than, than an agency. So, you know, for startups, the one thing I tell them with, with PR agencies in particular is to be very careful about the relationship you have with them because they have big overheads and they have lots of people. And I think you can get as, as good, if not better, performance from your dollars um, by using people who are like you, who are entrepreneurial like you, who think like you, who have, or are kind of in startup mode like you are and have great experience that they want to that they want to get involved with. That said, a plug for agencies like Hill and Knowlton, they're doing some work with Mars right now. Um, a number of uh, you know vendors are, are wanting to actually work with startups more and more because that's where the growth's going to be in their practice if they get it right with some of these. So you might be very surprised. We've had some entrepreneurs that have on, um, I'm not going to name numbers, but on, on some pretty slim budgets have gotten some very impressive proposals from bigger firms. Is that a sustainable um, thing? Uh, tough. But uh, you know, with some of the programs that they're putting in, it's more designed to get them up to a certain speed where they can then take over. But the other thing I want to add is that the one thing I've noticed in the last couple of years with the recession is one of the silver linings was a lot of really good people got flushed out of companies, out of the big agencies, and they've, they had no choice but to go solo. And a lot of them have discovered as the economy's coming back that it's a much better place to be. So the range of talent out there, whether it's public relations or design or development, um, there's lots and lots of different options at great prices. Very sutter friendly. 
do you uh, yeah. do you know what uh, go to Twitter I start to look at who's got you know a fair amount of weight and expertise and ask them they're only too happy to come back and, and give you a number of names and then interview those people it's never yeah. been a better time to find people in terms of using social media to do that I, I was just going to say as well usually people that sit on panels are open for business so <laughs> talk to them too Sorry, just to add something, like I take the complete opposite point of view in terms of outsourcing. I think if you're going to outsource to anyone, outsource to someone like Mark, hands down. I used to work at a PR agency. I worked on nine clients at a time. I promise you, Mark is going to give you way more attention than an agency will. I'm never for, and you don't have to pay him a retainer. You don't, it's just way better. But I actually believe that when you're a startup, you need people that are as passionate as you are about what you're doing, and you can't outsource passion 24 hours a day. Mark's going to be amazing for you on a project basis, but he's not there to evangelize your brand 24 hours a day. And you need that person full time. You won't get them for $5,000, but I actually think it's a great investment. You can get someone who's just out of school and probably pay them between thirty dollars and $50,000 for a year and, and get, you know, not eight hour days, you know, a lot of work out of them. And not only that, they become the face of your brand. Like, you know, I focus only on Sprouter. I am the face of Sprouter and I devote all my attention to it and I am passionate about it. And I think you need to find, as an entrepreneur, you need to find someone who is as passionate as you are and who can share your vision with the world because, you know, I just don't think a PR agency can do that. And um, in terms of finding people, I think uh, Humber College has an amazing PR program and they're actually teaching them social media and some of these tools in the program. My advice would be make friends with the PR professors there and get to know the students because they're coming out way more prepared than anyone else, in my opinion, in terms of social media and startups. And uh, they'd be a great asset to one of your teams. And they're always looking for internships and experience. Yeah. We brought on That's two great. interns. Uh, one was from Humber, one wasn't, and you know they were great assets to, to help me, and they want to get their feet wet. They want to learn about this stuff, and they were unpaid positions, so you can point. find help that's completely unpaid. Uh, well, I, would, I mean, I would argue the, the experience to do, uh, debate everyone on this panel accept, accepted, of course, or as an exception, but uh, to, the uh, to the point specifically about outsourcing a lot of like core competencies. I mean, I view marketing into, to a lesser extent, uh, PR as an extension, marketing as a core competency. And I see far too many companies going externally uh, for knowledge that they, that they need in internally. It's like uh, one, of, uh, one of our colleagues says, it's akin to outsourcing your brain. I mean, you need that in, in your head and you need that, that, whether it be embodied through a person who's acting in the role or even knowledge that you carry yourself, I mean, that has to be part of your modus operandi. Just not to push this too much, but there is also that, uh, that problem with going in with $5,000 and then what next? And that's the problem if you hit social media and you start to nail up all these channels, you get some conversation going and then do you just flare out? That's kind of a no-no. Um, and so there needs to be a, a broader plan. So I, I, at, at the risk of being flip, I, I kind of agree with Mark. In some ways, you've got to rephrase the question and not start with a plugged figure, but really look at what your requirements are. And maybe what, you can't pay them in salary, you can give them in equity. Are you I love It'll work for, for me, it for is. <laughs> Just a very quick question. Are there any services similar to Voices.com for making videos, whether it's anime or regular, that you recommend that you can kind of put your description out there and they come up with creative stuff? I've done, and I've done some research for our entrepreneurs because these questions come up a lot in terms of demo, on-screen personalities. There is a company locally here called Video Bio, and Video Bio is right here at the foot of Cabbage Town, uh, Parliament and... Uh, and uh, it's just around the corner. And they're, uh, they're doing a lot of uh, green screen work and working with talent and, and keeping it very real for startups in terms of their pricing. And this is kind of a new explosion we're seeing of green screen video work where you can then put animated effects where that could be screenshots or features of your product as uh, an on-person, uh, an on-screen person is talking. The, the other possibility is also going to Sheridan has an excellent video and animation pr uh, program, depending upon when you hit them, when they start uh, their various uh, semesters. I mean, you, people are looking to build, as a project, people are looking to build out, uh, build out their portfolio. And uh, again, they're looking for extra cash too, so. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, 
want to wrap up relatively soon here. Just keep on schedule because some people probably want to get going. We said till 7. Any other burning questions from the audience? I've seen quite a few hands here. Why don't we just take two more quick questions and then we'll wrap up. Does that sound good? I just wanted to share one resource with the group. There's a grant out that if you hire a student for four months that works on social media and design an internship program, um, the government will actually reimburse 75% of their wages. Um, so thought that might be a really great resource that ties into bringing talent in-house and then as well getting some help funding it. The SBIP. Excuse, sorry? CSBIP? Oh, no, the SBIP Small Business Internship Plan. No, it's the same one. We use that this summer. So the small business internship program is what you're referring to then? <coughs> it's full for 2010, but you can apply in, in 2011. Mm -hmm. Cool. Good point. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Uh, we had one other question. I'm gonna I'm gonna just take one more and then and then real quick. Yeah. This this guy hasn't uh, had a question yet. But this guy has the microphone over here, so I'll take you next. All right. Here we go. Okay. Great. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, at what point uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the startup process should a company start to look at uh, ensuring that their terms of service and privacy policy, all those things, protect themselves legally from anything that may or may not happen? Like exactly. as soon as you start taking in money or right. as soon as you reach right critical mass. Right off the bat. Right off the bat. Right yeah. off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. On your website before yeah. you even launch. We do, but I mean, we, like, you know, get it legally checked and everything. Absolutely. Front to back. Just okay. Contextualize it for us. What area are you in right now? As much um, as you can talk about what category? It's uh, it's the eBay for services. Okay. Um, <laughs> so so yeah, 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 get yeah, off the website. Uh, it's the yeah, Darth Vader. Vader. Is the name of that website? <laughs> this but, for that dot com. Yeah. <laughs> you know dot com. Anyway. Um, so so yeah. I mean, we're gonna be you know taking in money from contractors, but I. If we we don't know how they're not paying through us. I mean, we're going to be collecting a service fee. Service you're, you're collecting any money, or you're collecting any data. You're setting cookies. Any of these things require policies internally, right? And then they need outside counsel. Generally, you, you I, none of these people I think would advise you to do your own, um, you know, yeah, your own legal work on this and get it papered properly. And then you need to inform people. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because we've, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, I was just going to say, if you have a low budget, but you want legal advice, Mars actually has a law firm called Cognition, okay. and they mm -hmm. hold office hours here every week. So if you go on, Cog if, I don't know the website, but if you Google it, hopefully their SAO is good, and they come up first. And I know them personally, they're great guys, and they would be happy to help anybody come up with their terms of service, and oh, right you wouldn't have to um, pay a huge fee for that. Okay. See us after the break. We're happy to chat about that because we have relationships with a lot of different service providers like Cognition. And but even like I did, we did a contest at Sprouter and people scare the bejesus out of you saying if you don't get your contest rules, you know, looked over by a lawyer, then people can come back to you. And yeah. I mean, at a certain point, it gets a little ridiculous, right? I mean, we kind of took a model online and just plugged in our name and that kind of stuff. We didn't feel it was necessary to pay a lawyer to look something over for giving away an iPad. Right. Now, when it comes to TOS and your entire, you know, the basis of your yeah, state, yeah, I think yeah. it's a little more important and worth yeah. your dollar. So I would okay. advise... So it's actually a good point. The contest one will you'll get you every time, especially when you look at Quebec. The rules are completely different mm -hmm. if you right. get a national contest and it's an online advertisement, and it's hitting uh, people, consumers in Quebec, you can be hauled in front of uh, people for that. So if you're giving something away at a trade show, that's totally different. But when it hits online, nothing replaces some good counsel on that, getting it right. And just the first thing I do is I just grab a template from a site that I really trust mm -hmm. and then give that to a lawyer. Don't start from scratch. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, you know, try to find a comparable site that's already spent that kind of money. That's what entrepreneurs do. Yeah. It's not a lot of money. <laughs> All right, got it. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. It's been great. Good questions, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, any other closing comments? Um, I think we're. If anyone is looking for a community manager or wants to know more about it, I'm happy to chat and uh, know a lot of people who have come to me saying that they're looking for opportunities, so would be happy to put you in touch. I guess likewise, if you need to know anything from me, I think just alexblom.com or at alexblom on Twitter. We don't have handles up there, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll we'll hit the hashtag and actually uh, throw some stuff up on the portal later if you guys can take a look and make sure you can connect with these yeah. folks. I'm Erin at Spreader.com. Easy. Similarly, um, 
first initial, last name um, at Twitter. So uh, if you guys have any questions uh, on any range of topics, whether it be social media, S SEO, marketing, or, or, or Snuggies, which I <laughs> would like not to carry through the subway. Did anybody else? Did we get a thousand? I don't know. Let me, let, let me check yeah. it out. I think everyone's been like really good about actually uh, or listening to us rather than... Uh, I know. But uh, yeah, no, I'm totally open. Come approach after the, after the panel. And my partner's advice would be don't suck. Seriously, at the end of the day, you know, I focus a lot on messaging and a lot on branding and articulating who you are and why it matters and blah, blah, blah. We'll and the, the idea of, you know, the funnel and sales. But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, if your service is good and it's solid and it serves a need, uh, then that's the foundation for everything. Um, so make sure that what you're doing or what you're building or what you're offering actually is good. And maybe the world will beat a path to your door, maybe not. But but if it sucks, then nothing else matters because at the end of the day, you'll just disappear. So that's my no piece of No point in a great marketing campaign if you have a crappy product. Yeah. <laughs> and don't come out too early. If, you're, if your product's not ready for prime time, take the extra time, take a deep breath, and go when you're ready, not when you think the market's It's ready. not a race. Yeah. Maybe. So I'd, I'd just like to say uh, thanks to all of our panelists uh, for coming out and sharing their thoughts. <laughs> thanks, guys. Appreciate it.